Welcome to B Shifter. It is John Vance, Nick Brunacini, Terry Garrison. And today, Ask the Chiefs. We get questions from you. You can send them in to John Vance at bshifter.com. And we'd love to get your questions. We'd love to talk about your questions. So we will do that today. How are you guys doing? Esto muy bien. I'm fine. He's dandy. We're fine and dandy. Yeah. What's new with you? With me? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Just the uh, leadership that we're working on. Yeah. How's that coming? Articles coming out. Um, I think we're, there's going to be an article coming out here very shortly uh, on uh, function number one, which is start with the work. I think we talked a little bit about that on our last podcast. And uh, Nick and I wrote that. And the editor, Michelle Garrido, uh, fixed it after I wrote it. <laughs> she and, fixes everything. And approved it, and uh, I got the final yesterday. It looks pretty good. Well, Garrison wrote it, and I just commented on a part, and then Garrido, like you said. She did a really good job. Bleached it all. I and, used too many words to say too little, and then she fixes that. I have to have questions for her, like, is this possessive, um, or is oh, it plural, or do yeah. I put yeah, – and, and it's always at, like, 10 o'clock at night before the B-Shifter buck slip comes out. Because I start right. looking at it again, and it's like, no, oh, I'm not so good with the English language sometimes. I go from past tense to present, then <laughs> yeah. back to past. Yeah. Or second person, first yeah. person. Yeah. Uh, uh. You know, and sometimes I mean for it to look like that and, and read that way, and uh, it'll get changed. And I'll say, no, I meant for it to say what it said. It's, it's well, no, it's not correct. It's, it, it, I, you edit a journal called B Shifter. It's the way I want it to read. We Thank make you. Up, make up our own language. And sometimes I actually am successful in doing it. No, she'll sometimes she does. She takes a couple of my words and tries to use a better, bigger word. And I go, no, go back. <laughs> but she's so smart. She you know, she was going to uh, run some something the other day. And she says, you know, it's the first time I've said this, but uh, it's not very often that you can run an article where there's a graphic of a firefighter fantasizing of decapitating mm-hmm. people. And I said, yeah, I said, what well, we. we we talk about uh, the struggle with our inner demons all the time, it, especially uh, as it gets later in the evening. So it, it's, yeah, these are issues that we need to explore and consider so we can dominate them. Some people are pain in the neck and you try to remove that neck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it's, it's more metaphorical than anything yeah. else. Yeah, we never killed, really. we never killed anyone on Not a call. Not that they can prove. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> check out that mechanism that. of injury. Yeah. So <laughs> that mechanism of injury. <laughs> I just want to rub it all over me. That mechanism of injury. <laughs> we'll have to fly you in a helicopter to the uh, hospital that's three blocks away. It's, oh. You know, it, it, it's the true things that hurt the most. Mm-hmm. It's, you, the, you did what? Yeah. Oh, no, morning traffic's a bitch. No, no, not helicopters. But I like the sound of helicopters. Is your life worth $21,000? <laughs> Shh, you don't have to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we got to ask the Chiefs. Okay. Wow. Um, this this would be, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see what Terry says about this one oh, and, and Nick, but um, it's Dear Chiefs, communication seems to be one of the biggest problems in our organization. Not on scene communications, but internal communications about administrative needs, new policies, and general practices. It seems the rumor mill is faster than actual communication from the front office. What methods have you used to ensure messages are being transmitted up and down the chain? Yeah, communication. I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) So um, the rumor mill works really well. You can actually use that, right? Mm -hmm. If you use it right. So put some on your desk and say highly confidential. Don't turn it over and just leave it there for about an hour. The news will get out. Oh, yeah. Um, But, yeah, you got to have some sort of formal communication line right the problem that i see is that um we over communicate goofy stuff too much i mean there's too many emails going out there's too many memos there's too even when with with our department bruno back in the day we would get something from every everybody all the time all the chiefs 
all the way down. And it's like, jeepers, creepers, this this is not working. So you get to the point where you just ignore everything. It's like going to the to the mailbox now and you put your recyclable dumpster right next to the mailbox and take all that trash and throw it right in the mail because it's not worth reading. It's just garbage. So um, we had something in Phoenix that worked really well for quite a while, and that was a buck slip. Mm-hmm. Right? That was the best. That that Out of all of my scene, that was the best. The weekly buck slip. So yeah. what was that? How did that work? So it was. Uh, it would go out to all the fire stations, and it was something in paper to, back then. And even today, I think sometimes paper is better than email. Oh, it's a far superior. Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't. Well, we produce a buck slip today. We converted the B Shifter magazine into a buck slip. Yeah. So, it, to to your point, Vance is like we would send out every three to four months a new issue of B Shifter. Well, it makes more sense to send out a weekly thing to everybody, and then you can just, it's the same content, essentially. It's just that you divide it up and you send it out weekly, so it becomes more of a thing. Yeah. And then you don't have to spend as much time with it either. So you get the the B-Shifter buck slip, you can go through in 20, 30 minutes, yeah. less than an hour for most of it. Well, the B-Shifter magazine was pretty dense and had a lot, you know. Yeah. So you would go through it over a week or so or whatever it was. I think it's just an easier, more digestible way to give you the material. And what it was is is the different um, divisions would put whatever memo was most important that week, and they would put one or two memos in there that would give you information. So it was what? Maybe? It was open to everybody, which was it, a good yeah, thing. It was, so in like some weeks it was really thick, and others yeah. it was a little thinner. But the other thing that was in there was all the EMT recertification stuff and EMS. Yes. So yeah. like the training bulletins that would come out and say, okay, this is the roster of who's got to go to staff uh, – Three weeks from now to go through their EMT research. So all that timely kind of information you would get. And this kind this was developed before email. So, you know, you didn't have email to send out to barrage everybody with. And I think what Terry says is right. There's too many forms of communication. There was in our fire department. Yeah. <clears throat> So we had this weekly buck slip. Then you would have like these these uh, quarterly meetings that, for all the, the the different committees that we used to run the fire department. So there was just so much going on all the time. It was hard to keep track of what everybody was doing. And then you throw quarterly reports in it, which was more of a formalized organizational approach to it. And I remember <clears throat> as a BC, and, and nobody told you this. My, my boss comes in, he says, okay, it's your turn, and you've got to do the quarterly reports for the battalion, for the district, this this go-round. Well, what's that look like? And so you sit down, he shows you the template. So we all have to report these different things, special projects, number of incidents, uh, b- b- bigger events, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. So the first time I did it, it took like, a, I bet I spent two or three weeks like at work during the week, at least two or three hours a day building this thing. And I think, okay, this is what it is. And I took it serious. And and then they would compile all this stuff into the quarterly reports. And so every quarter they would put out about a thousand pages of quarterly reports from all the different divisions, you know, so you had all the battalions. So all nine battalions would have their own quarterly report that would get compiled, and they report on the same things. You know, so battalion to battalion, you could look at what was going on. Then all the different divisions would have stuff in it. And then they would have a formalized meeting once. It would be four to eight hours, depending. I mean, sometimes they'd cater lunch, and they would go over quarterly reports, and then people would report. And you did that every three months. So like the second time it came around and nobody read it was the other thing I thought. And I asked my dad, who reads this? He says, I read it. Okay, great. So about (laughs) a year into it, uh, they said, it's your turn to do quarterly reports again. Okay, fine. Well, I just sat down in front of my computer in about four hours. I spit the whole thing out. And towards the end of it, I I started uh, just making shit up. (laughs) I remember reading that. So liar no you showed it to me oh i may have sent it to it yeah but like the city next to us was glendale half my calls were in glendale so i said i I made this thing up and i said glendale's coming into phoenix and they're breaking into stations and stealing the peanut butter out of the kitty (laughs) and i said so what i have done is uh late at night battalion three drives around we look for these crews and we take them hostage and shave their heads so we can identify them quickly as they're running down the street with our kitty supplies and 
there was a submarine that I had bid and specced that we were going to put in the lagoon that we kind of shared between our first two do, first two areas. So it was just this. Nobody com- read. So <laughs> it, it, what happened was you shared it with me like two weeks after. <laughs> exactly. Did you read it? And I go, no, nah, let me show it to you. But, you know, so, so, <laughs> so what? You could go to jail for some of the stuff I put in there. I thought nobody reads these things. You know, so what I did in a couple departments, because that was the buck slip worked for a while, because the really the key to the buck slip, the Knicks and I left out. At the time, there was a page in the back, a couple pages in the back, where you would sell stuff or you would ask questions. So you would ask a, a specific question about something. It would go into the buck slip office, wherever that was was and they would route it to the appropriate chief and the chief would have a couple days or a week to respond and he'd get it out in the next so you would actually some of those questions were really good and then people would sell their mini bikes or whatever it was called the backdraft the backdraft it was was the best part yeah the best part you saved it it was like dessert at the end but what happened was after a few years that people were writing like if i knew you had some kind of issue going on I would write a question about that, and nobody would know that it was all. So then all the questions became a fodder for guys that they, you didn't even know. And the assistant chiefs were so disconnected from the organization, they didn't realize that the questions were made up, and they were just people screwing with other people. Wow. And so it kind of, and then I think Bruno figured it out. It's like, okay, we got to stop this. Oh, it, it, it became so exquisite. Is Chris Stewart and Mike Worrell. <clears throat> would put they would put propaganda in and, and fake stuff so th- <laughs> they did this deal once where there was this battalion chief on another shift that they screwed with constantly cheapest man in the history of the world this guy was taking his family on vacation once and he's backing out he's got the rv hooked up they're going to the mountains the phone rings and they gave him like a 12-hour shift the overtime shift on an Ambo, he pulled the truck right back into the garage. Sorry, kids, not going this week. <laughs> put his uniform on, went to work, worked on an Ambo 12 hours. They put this thing in at Costco where you got, a, a, if you bought one Caesar salad with chicken, you got a second one for free. Oh. Well, he cuts that out, man. He's going to eat free Costco chicken Caesar salad for the week. And he goes in and he takes his coupon. And, I mean, they almost called the police on him. They said, we don't have those coupons. It was all made up. And it was in the buck slip. Oh, yeah. it was in the buck slip. Oh, the whole wow. deal. Guys are selling other guys' equipment and stuff. Guys would be in jail in Mexico over, like, things they shouldn't have been doing, like, whatever. And they So they would make things up about... Uh, this guy's name, Garage in Tijuana. <laughs> and, you're like, and it would appear, and you think, how far can I take it? Yeah, it just so just it, being completely out of bounds in the buck slip. They had to stop it. It was like a year. It was the greatest publication that existed. Well, shit, like in New York City, it, th- th- this kind of came up during this period where they were trying to figure out what to do. Is, and you talked about it. Rumors are halfway around the world before the truth can wake up and put on its shoes. Right. In New York City, if a firefighter gets arrested for something, it's usually like for DUI, domestic violence. Those are the mains. You know, the, 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 anybody who works in HR could tell you this. This is what happens. In FDNY, they would publish a journal and, and, and they would put in your name that you were arrested, what for and what your penalty was, and then the discipline that you were getting in the fire department. Whoa. Yeah, and they said, no, we're, we're, we're killing the rumors. This is what it is. It's all legal, Sorry. and you can get all this information from the court. And they said, that's what yeah. we do, is we just— That'd be it, worth reading. Yeah. Wow. Well, oh, exactly. So, I mean, that's— <clears throat> Well, and you think about it, the, the rumors that go around, you know, uh, Billy's missing. He hasn't been here yeah. for 30 days. What's going on with Billy? Oh. Okay, yeah, he, yeah, he you got suspended right? because of HR would tell you whatever. you can't disclose Yeah, HR, our HR wouldn't, but I bet yeah. you it's something in their contract or yeah. so, something allows them to be able to disclose yeah. that. Because I've seen them hanging up in New York City fire stations. Yeah, right? I mean, it's, yeah. and it's, it's just, on the bulletin board. It, yeah. It's just, it, here's the facts. And yeah. you, wow, okay, yeah. You know, which is completely different because most places, oh, it's under investigation. Right. That's their, We can't discuss anything oh, under investigation. I use that a lot. Well, yeah, that's maybe a good answer, but... It, we kind of know what's going on in the fire station, so you could say that to to the to the reporter, but it's no, a little he, different inside. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah. So, so back on your track because that was fun. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I hey, tried, well, you never know where this is going. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I used in uh, Houston because it's such a large department, and it worked in a smaller department. So I tried in Houston. I used like a message from the chief, so it was titled, and I used it in Glendale too. And it's like, so if it was coming from me, I thought, well, maybe somebody would read it—a message from the chief. And um, <laughs> I thought that would work well. But you know, it's one of those deals where you know it only if it feels good when you you check a box. I sent this out, mm-hmm. so it feels pretty good. I don't know who is reading it or not reading it. I found out later that you know the same people are going to stay connected and read it, and yeah. that's probably about what twenty thirty percent, maybe at the most, that may read it. But um, a lot of people don't. Another <laughs> thing they did in Glendale, just to kind of answer your question, is. Um, uh, Chris Gustafson, the guy who was there, who is a resource guy, did a really good job. He was running uh, logistics or resource or support, whatever you want to call it. And he would put out uh, a quarterly or I think it was a bi-monthly, but he would put together a really nice package of what he was working on. And it would maybe be four pages and he had some graphics to it and everything. And he would send it out and people would read that. That was a great way to do it. But but like you said, so you got to, you know, you could do the written, you could do the email, you could do the meetings. Meetings to me are the worst. They're yeah. absolutely worst, man. It's like we have meetings on top of there's fire chiefs who have four hour meetings every Monday. What the hell can you t- what happened over the weekend that you gotta talk about for four hours every Monday? Meetings have the greatest capacity for communicating with people because you're in person. But it, 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 it's like the little boy that cried wolf. Like you, you said, is there's too many of them. It's yeah. like, no, I'm, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. We're just meeting now to meet. And I think that's that's part of like the uh, like the cup you want to fill up. Oh, I went to all these meetings. I'm a right. great employee. You're like, right. no. You, you, all you did is you sat on your phone today and you played solitaire while they talked about bullshit nobody cares about. Yeah. I mean, that's the, everybody gets to have a meeting. We're doing command training at the CTC. We had the highest attendance of any training, whether it was mandatory or That's voluntary. Right. It was because people wanted to do it. it. It was important to them. It was training, not meeting, though. Yeah, That's no, we were training. Say. And yeah, that's, we that's like, no, no, no. I'm going to learn how to sound better on the radio so people will respect me at a higher level. That, yeah. that, that's kind of what it was. <clears throat> Personnel HR calls up and they say, we need uh, 30 minutes of the next session. We've talked about this before in here. Yeah. It, and, and well, why? Well, because we need to we need to have we need to inform the workforce about the new grooming policy to talk about tattoos and Fu Manchus. We're having a real issue with that. And I thought, you know, that does not fit into an IDLH hazard zone anywhere. The way I deal with that is they wear full protective gear. We don't worry about beards or any of that. It's, uh, you know, well, no, we're going to do it. No, you're not. Thank you. Five minutes later, the assistant chief calls back and says, I outrank you. <laughs> yeah, but I ain't in your division. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. The reason people come to this training is we don't talk about this silliness. This is a... a Put it in the buck slip. You can't do this anymore. They they know. You've informed them. So now they're aware of the rule. We got into this deal about Code 3 driving for a while, where we were crashing trucks and hurting people. I remember there was a thing with the the training that we had is people were going to have to sign a document that they understood they couldn't run red lights anymore. And the union went crazy. They said, you can't do this. And you're like, well... Because it was like a contract where if you violated it, you could be held criminally and all all this other stuff. And you're like, you know, I guess that's a discussion for somebody else and personnel and legal and wherever else with the union. I mean, mean, the administration and figure out how are we going to proctor this, to you know. But at the end of the day, you can't run a red light anymore, asshole. So what you need to do is get the chiefs together and say, when you see them do this, this is what you have to do. Right. So you kind of have a – and having a CTC was a great place to do that because the stuff that typically will injure or kill you is operational in nature. And we had an ops yeah. training center where you could bring people in and you could discuss things 
that actually apply to like code three driving or, or, or like deployment of ambulances at the hazard zone and under IDLH and, and, and the, the supervision of what a captain, a company officer had to do, particularly one who was the IC. And, and kind of, so, right. and that's why people came to the CTCs. They said, well, nobody's ever given us a straight answer on this. And yeah. so, oh, no, no, no. We're answering questions now because we need to. This is, yeah. yeah. This is for us more than you guys. But Just, don't, yeah. yeah, but you can't let um, <coughs> your training be diluted with information that could be provided some other way. Yeah. Communications, yeah. basically. Yeah. So in Glendale, they have, they still do, they have an EMS Wednesday for training, which is very effective. Everybody knows on Wednesday when you show up, your crew is going to go. Mm -hmm. And if that's yeah. the day you're identified for that Wednesday, you're going to go to training. Nobody. So kind of having consistency and set expectations for people where they know on this day, I'm going to do this. Uh, if we could do that with communication, too, if we could say, OK, like that was what's good about the bucks. If it would come out on a specific day every week, people would read it. It had a beginning, a middle and an end. And people would move on from that one to the next one. But what you see is you see a lot of communication like they're they're. You're being informed of something that's going to happen three months from now. Or that whole deal about the quarterly reports with the data. I hated that. Nobody gives a shit. That's a history lesson for maybe some fire chiefs and maybe some other people within the system can use to get resources later. But firefighters don't give a shit about. Now, there are some that like to mark their calls and know, oh, we had more calls than anybody else. But in general, people don't want it. They don't need all that data on the back end. No, my old man would tell, he'd say, no, I use quarterly reports to run the fire department. This is how I keep everybody on track and do the thing. And th well, hey, man, that's good for you. Right. And he says, just keep making up your silliness and having your fantasies and what you do at the 3rd Battalion <laughs> and report on that. Uh, he's, he hears that story about us having a submarine and we're at war with the Glendale Fire Department. And he says, you know, I early on, I wrote in the first page the introduction of the first quarterly report that that, that uh, your fingers touched poison on the first pages and the only antidote is contained on the pages in the back so you have to read the whole thing and I said so you knew from the moment you started this it what was, you were yeah, doing he yeah. says exactly he says it's it's not to inform so much it is to keep people on track that's yeah. he says when you have to report on these things that becomes your job. And you say, oh, look at the big brain on Bruno. <laughs> you, you, you're manipulating us is what you're doing. He said, exactly. He says, yeah. I was raised by an Italian mother who believed in the, the Catholic religion. That's Man, you know, I think. What you're, yeah. I yeah. think any organization where you have decentralized workers like we have, is communication is an issue, right? So how do you communicate with them best? I think you ought to try, uh, fire chiefs ought to try a couple of different things and see what work, whether it's an email that you need to somehow click on and then you know you read it. There was a time in our fire department, Nick, I was back then, when you got a really important email, it came with your pay stub. Now, mm -hmm. of course, that's silly nowadays, but there, if you could tie it to where there's some sort yeah, of... Yeah, that was pretty uh, good. You remember that? Yeah. Some yeah. Sort well, that of, wasn't an email. That was like an actual yeah. union's customer it, service yeah. book. It was right with you. Stapled right there. Wow, yeah. that's a, that very... That's a yeah. powerful that's message. A, yeah. Ooh. Or your W-2 or yeah, whatever exactly. the hell that was. Uh -huh. Your but, uniform allowance. Right. Yeah. But uh -huh. if you, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I love that. My <laughs> wife never knew about those back mm -hmm. then. Yeah, that, I, that, nobody did for a while. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, I think, but you got it. You can't just not communicate. You can't quit, right? You can't say, but, well, nothing's working, so I'm not going to communicate because then you, you seem like you're, you, you got to stay connected somehow. What's worked for you, John? And, and you can't over communicate, though, is the other thing. Because then saying. it dilutes it and people don't give a shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. People well, don't, they could look listen. At the, look at the problem we're talking about. It's how do you communicate, keep the workforce connected? Every one of us has a goddamn smartphone that we're on all day. I mean, that's it's a, it's a communication device, I guess. So, yeah. and you're seeing that more and more. People are using, well, they have been forever, social media to get your message out and the rest of it. It's just, I mean, it's like using your toilet to make spaghetti in. No, it doesn't work. It's... <clears throat> yeah, social media isn't used to communicate, John, I don't think. It, it, it's, a, yeah. Yeah, you're an IT kind of guy. Do, intranet. Mm -hmm. Intranet. Yes. Do those still, are yes. those, those yeah. still pretty effective? Yeah, we've, we've got an intranet. Okay. 
it's called Insight. Okay. But uh, yeah, you can get on there and get 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 your information. Yeah, I think that one of the things that we want to watch is because you've dealt with these employees before that want to send a, an email out on everything. It's oh, the daily yeah. email. Yeah. And we say, save all of that. Don't send the entire department an email every day or, you know, all, all these different divisions. Every two weeks, we put out a newsletter called Smoke Signals. Put it in oh. that. Now, if it's something important, you know, there's been a death in the department or something, you know, those yeah. are the those are the bulletins that mm-hmm. that, that yeah. has to get out right away. But anything else that's a normal operating deal, and and we do the same thing. We have uh, operations reports every week. Right. That's that is in uh, the that goes right into the smoke signal, so everybody gets to read the reports if they want to. But that helps the fire chief run the department because it's going to help with requests for right. resources or new station staffing or whatever else that we're doing. But I my my piece of advice is be transparent. Don't yeah. hold back information, but put it out in regular intervals, whether it's every week or every two weeks or every month. Collect it all, give it to them, and then it also let them know how the fire department's yeah, performing. Yeah, you, you kind of said you got to have a clearing house for that. It mm-hmm. can't come from just everybody. Yeah. All you know, people are sending out emails to the entire organization. No, it becomes therapy yeah. almost. And you can't, I, it, it's, it's not the right way to I do it. I got that it, too, it's, where it's I have people. Splinter. Hey, I got to get this out right away. Well, let me see what it is. No, no, it yeah. isn't. Why would you this need to get not, this out right away? That, you know, we're going to change training next month. Yeah. Well, no, we'll put that, put that in the newsletter. Yeah, yeah that's the schedule. You know. That's in yeah. the schedule. Yeah. yeah. See, if you can electronically uh, control the schedule for everybody in the fire department, that's yeah. a huge deal because mm-hmm. that's where you put the oh, here's the change, and you just go to your. When the crew comes in in the morning, that should be what they're looking at. Okay, what's on our calendar for today? In fact, if they're the regular crew there, they should be looking at that, the shift they're getting off, and what are we doing next shift? See, that way the en- oh, the engineer knows it's rig day. I got to call in sick next shift. <clears throat> so being informed, you know that. One of the things we did, which was quite fascinating, uh, is we took this to the whole next level way back when, when we opened up our own TV station. Yeah. I mean, we ended up with the TV station. The city of Phoenix was able to strong arm Cox Cable and say, we need our own production facilities for the city. And we'll give you whoever we give the exclusive contract to for cable that comes into it. You got to figure out we got to be able to broadcast out of our public safety facilities. So, you know, that's where you can like take the airwaves over and let people know there's an emergency, whatever the hell it is. So. Our fire chief said, well, we're going to use that as a, we're going to do one hour of TV every week we're going to put out. And so the first guy went in and it was like corporate TV where there wasn't a host and it was just this stupid elevator music and a bunch of graphics that you read. And then sometimes every now and then they'd highly produce something with a narrator that was a bunch of B-roll. And you thought, no, this is something you put in the waiting room. Nobody <laughs> gives a shit about any of this. Elevator oh, music. Oh, exactly. Well, we ended up, however it happened, my brother and I ended up at PFN. And so we said, no, we're changing this. It was fate. Yeah, it was. It was It was meant to be. So it was beautiful. I remember the, the, the uh, dispatchers in the alarm room said, <laughs> they started calling my brother Jed Clampett. <laughs> or uh, uh, Jethro. Jethro, Jethro. Bodine because his daddy, <laughs> his daddy Jed Clampett bought him a TV station. <laughs> Well, I worked that into like a promo thing. I just pissed my brother off. <laughs> no, they can't say that. Yeah, they can't. It's hysterical, man. Come on. Just think, I think, Will, you know, we can really do something with this. You know, you dress up and well, I, I could be somebody else. We'll get Ellie Mae. And like, no, we're not talking about me. <laughs> I hear there's some fire chiefs that are doing videos, too, and then they send it out. And Yeah, I tried doing that. That's I, not yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's like some Eva Perone yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, message from the chief. That, yeah. Those just lend like, themselves yeah. to being uh, like sarcastic uh, commenting. Yeah. You know, so um, we did after action reviews for a while. After action reports. That's what got us down into... PFN as we were doing after action reviews and with just one thing led to another. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I guess it's content, right? You got to have good content. If you get, want somebody to read it. 
And yeah. what brings people into reading, you know, after action reviews, mm-hmm. you guys were entertaining. That brought people in, the entertainment mm-hmm. value. Well, we used to say that, like, it was broken into thirds. A third of them watched it because they hated it. A third of them watched it because they loved it. And a third of them just weren't going to do anything anyway. So yeah. it didn't matter. Didn't people pirate cable boxes back then? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Like citizens, yeah, like, uh-huh. that that just to get the PFN content, yeah, they would be, because there for about a year. It was, I mean, <clears throat> there was going to be four or five minutes in every broadcast that probably shouldn't have been there. I don't know that you could do it today. Mm-hmm. They would, they would round you up and you would get charged. But, he, but or, he's right. I would go to you know being a roving captain or running around as a battalion chief. I would have people. One third of man, that was great. Did you see that? You go in and say that freaking Nick. I hate that song. Why is he doing that? That's this is embarrassing to me. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> oh, you but, but, wait but for but next the week. People that hated him watched it so they could hate him more. Oh, they they were the biggest fans. It was like the Howard Stern show. <laughs> it was uh, yeah, uh-huh. yeah right. They watch you because they hate you. <laughs> so the secret of that, the reason that it was successful though, was because it was done entertaining. Well, it, it has good content. It, we called it, it edutainment at the time. Yeah. It was is the bullshit word we made up. But it was like 95% just good, straight training yeah. content. And that then, if you followed it, you would have success in whatever you were, whether it was laying in supply lines or doing fire attack. Yeah. or We got to the point where you were actually getting like CE credit for like EMS stuff. And they said, it's just so boring, though, to watch an hour of EMS training on TV. Don't, And that's what came in. They said, don't do that anymore. We need it broken up like you guys do because we, we like the five to ten minute things. Mm-hmm. And then what we would do is it was easier to make a bunch of smaller clips, and like even creatively. And then you could like use these clips and play one off the other. And, and so it would, like we did an elevator deal, uh, an elevator operations and, and high-rise buildings during fires, right? And so it was, it was like a 15-minute video, and it was full of just excellent information about how you safely use elevators when you have a floor on fire. The only silliness we had is like the, the narrator is there talking to like his crew, and this is what we do, and he pushes the elevator button, the elevator comes down, doors open up, and they're getting ready to go in, and Dr. Tulio comes out <laughs> and looks at him like they're insects and just storms off. That was the comedy. Yeah, that was it. That was it. Wasn't thirty seconds long, and that was the whole thing we did during that little piece. So that was, yeah. a, but that was the hook that they were just waiting. It's a little Easter egg yeah. that everyone's uh-huh. waiting for to pop up because they know something funny is going to pop up during the middle of the serious content. Well, and it was all outlaw TV, so yeah. like we introduced stations and shifts. So we would go to a station, videotape all three shifts, and then we would say, "What's your favorite song for the station?" And so it was some rock and roll song we would put it on, and we violate every every copyright deal in the history of copyright mm-hmm. stuff because it was all closed circuit in the fire department. You thought nobody knew what the rules were. Like our video crew would go out and videotape real calls. And so you would have people's images in these videos. Yeah. And I remember one of the PIO gals early on says, well, no, you got to get their permission. And you're like, no, you don't. The media can film They're unconscious. Any. Yeah, the <laughs> media, exactly. Yeah, well, and I mean, there's dead people. There's hands, feet. Yeah, there, I mean, yeah. it's just, it, it's like faces of death TV, some of it. You're like, no, I can't. But anyway, you could do that back then. Well, today you can't do that. I mean, there's a whole set of rules and mm-hmm. privacy. Mm-hmm. And, and so it was just, the, the 80s and 90s were an easier time to be yeah. th- like a social society i guess yeah. there were there were less laws that went with that so you talk about you know what brings them in what's the hook so in a lot of organization in ours the meeting the hook was bruno right so every <laughs> once in a while and i don't know how often he did it whether it's quarterly or whatever but he'd have captain's meetings and um he would so people didn't miss those man if you had a chance to sit down in front of bruno with, with all the rest of the captains on about half the captains on that shift for a couple hours you made those meetings. Now, there's a time commitment to a fire chief. I was able to do that in some of the smaller departments I worked. And, like, you know, Houston, that would have been. Oh, he preferred but, those yeah. to everything. But and those are so favorite. good. So he would bring them in and do that. And But I, other, I've seen other fire chiefs in that same city try it, and it doesn't work. Because what they do is they come in, and I'm, I'm being critical here for a moment because I don't want 
anybody else out there to do what they did, is they would come in and they would be in the room, but it would be more of a reporting session where they would have each one of their division, each one of their assistant chiefs go around the room and would tell. And it was just reporting, and it was it was a waste of time. It, it, people didn't want to attend it from what I heard, and I wouldn't want to have attended it. But when you got the fire chief right there and you need just one or two Topics, you know, just maybe even just one, maybe something that's happened organizationally, maybe a current event type situation with a, 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 I don't know, a call you went on or an incident or whatever. Those two would capture everybody and we would sit there for two hours and wouldn't want to leave. And you got face to face with the fire chief, which means a lot to a lot of people. It did for us because we respected him. We wanted to be there. That's that's not a bad way to hold a meeting. But to bring everybody in and just report, have each report, and then just, it's just like a uh, chin boogie. Yeah. Right? So in those captains' meetings, were all the other chiefs in there, or was it just the captains and Bruno? Who, it, was oh, oh, it was everybody. Yeah, the, the, the chiefs would come in, and but see, there's trust in there too, right? So you could ask Bruno certain things in front of your chief, and it feels like it, you're not going to get one of those, hey, man, why'd you ask that kind of thing? Why'd you, why'd you go around this chain of command or whatever? Um, so there's a lot of trust in that. But he would sit in those meetings, and he would talk, and uh, there would be people that would show up who uh, – they wouldn't even have a reason. They come on their days off. I'm going to go to. I, I went out of town and I missed my chief's meeting, so I'm going to go this week and then show up for no overtime and participate in the meeting. But yeah, the chiefs were involved, but the chiefs wouldn't report. They would be a part of the conversation, right? So yeah, it's the, the, but the deal you, was it. You wanted to go to those meetings. Well, the reason I wanted to go to him it, it, it was not to hear what the fire chief had to say. I, I could hear that any time. <laughs> I went to hear what the crazy ass captains were going to say. Well, because those were so. comedy shows. I, I mean, you would have because it was an open forum typically. Yeah, yeah. As he would have people in, and like Terry said, it was like if it was an operations thing, it, it, like the meeting mostly dealt with operational stuff. The ops chief would be there and comment, so he would talk a little bit more, or a shift commander yeah. would. You know, somebody animated that understood what was going on. But a lot of it was just him discussing. I'll give you an example. Union negotiates a contract. <clears throat> the city comes back and says, well, no, we want you to be drug tested. We're drug testing everybody, and you guys haven't. You're, you're the only ones not being drug tested. And you have to agree to it. We can't make you do it. And so we had a very uh, uh, robust. A very yeah, robust union guy who understood how all this worked. And so what he was able to do was parlay a 10% across the board raise if we would do drug testing, <laughs> right? No, I mean, that's what it was. So the fire chief comes in and says, okay, here's the big deal on the city thing. And there were union guys in there who supported it because that's their job is to get you a raise. And they're like, and this is and this is what it's going to look like. So the city didn't care what the drug testing, uh, like the details of the policy were. They could give a rat's ass. We just want to say we're drug testing you. Well, the union comes back and says, okay, this is the most, this is the least invasive way to do this for us. It's, it's an unscheduled drug test that you can only give from like the the months of July to, to to December, well, shit, that's half the year. So I mean, you so you get it. But yeah. Anyway, we all come in. Fire chief says, "Hey, listen, the union wants to do this. The whole city's doing it. You know, we're not." And so you know, well, what do you think, chief? Well, you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to pee in the cup. And Randall Dunn, the, the most senior person in the room of anybody of well, maybe with the exception of my dad had more seniority, but he was the only one. <laughs> my dad looks at me and says, Randall, what do you think? And he says, well, chief, you're the chief for a reason, as I'll do what you tell me. And he says, what do you want us to do? And he says, well, I would do the drug test. You know, he says, good, because I got to piss. And he gets up and he goes, well, <laughs> yeah. And he says, come here, give me a cup. Not not yeah. <laughs> he says, well, okay, you go ahead and take care of your business. But I mean, and then <clears throat> you had three people that had a seizure that he said that. And so we had an argument for like 15, yeah. 20 minutes. And it was good. You could process all that. But what happened is, see, the communications is before you got back to the station, 
Twenty-five percent of the fire department knew what was said in that meeting. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, yeah, yeah. That was I mean, before you, cell phones. No, there it's were cell phones. There, there, I mean, but, I but yeah, that was a yeah. So you you hung up from your nine hundred number. <laughs> that you well, you had to call station fifteen. Well, we had a pager. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> telephone. Tell a friend. Tell a firefighter. But those were good. Those worked out really well. And um, you know, to have the fire chief show up and actually listen to people, that was a big deal. The pager I, was actually a ventilation device the pager yeah like when i <clears throat> you were a response chief to have a pager uh -huh. and if it was like the second time it woke you up you ventilated by throwing that on the ground as hard as you could <laughs> and it would come into 27 pieces and you'd have to get a new pager sorry but <clears throat> that's my pager story that's his pager story yeah so limit the communications you know where the don't over communicate. You've got to communicate in, in a way that people are actually going to pay attention to it and you're not uh, saturating them with messages all day. And then have some creative ways to communicate right. things like PFN. Mm -hmm. If you could have some fun while doing it and then regular meetings with the fire chief, if if it's going to be a forum to actually ask questions right. and, and it's a two way communication, not just the, the fire chief addressing the masses and we shall wear this uniform and we shall do this. You don't want that. You, no, want, you don't want that. You want there to be an actual conversation with with the people. Well, even just like keeping connected. <clears throat> I remember this was an issue we talk about all the time and people thought, okay, a good BC goes and visits their stations at least once every week. They, they go to yeah. every single station every other shift. in their battalion or yeah. every other shift. So like twice a week, you got to go see all your stations. And I thought, all right, I'm a new BC. I go, we drive around for I don't know, two or three weeks. I'm like, this is bullshit. Jesus Christ. We just drive around. And <clears throat> so what I started doing is I get all the, the correspondence I had with all the companies in my battalion. I put it in a box. I throw it in the back seat of the truck. And then when we would go on calls, that's where I uh, hang on. We're going to have a two minute meeting. So like gradings, anything like that, that was just standard routine, everyday communications. That's the way I did it. So the, yeah. I don't go visit the stations very much unless there's an inspection or something. They invite me because I take care of most of my business on the road with them. So, two, thi two things about visiting stations. First, uh, it's a good idea for a chief officer, even a fire chief, to visit a fire station. I tried in Glendale, and they were so busy. They were always gone. Mm -hmm. I drove around. They're gone. I drove, they're on calls. Yeah, that was the other but, part. But <laughs> as a, I've had people ask me when I was kind of a new battalion chief, yeah, even when I was an older battalion chief, is that there's always that one captain that you really don't get along with that you don't <laughs> want to visit. It's like, I don't want to go visit that crap bastard. Go visit him in the morning get it over with you know if you have somebody you really enjoy save them for the afternoon and kind That's of the in, treat kind yeah. of in your day with that but get get that other guy now people hear this and i'll go oh yeah i'm the guy you don't like you're here in the morning but they know it because they don't like you either but that's kind of the way it works but you got to get out and visit your stations and have a you know just stop in with a purpose one or two little items and and go visit because a lot of chief officers they don't visit their stations until something goes wrong and then they're showing up it's like oh the chief's here something's wrong you don't want that in your organization whether you're a middle manager or an executive he's here what happened no, and I would explain that because that happened to me several times. And I'm like, you are 100 percent correct. I would not normally come here because I don't like you. And, and But, you know, I'm your boss and you can't keep doing this. And if you don't <laughs> want me coming here, you got to stop these behaviors, right. period. You're screwing all of us, not only me, but my boss and the people who work for you. you knock it off. One, one of our blue card instructors uh, had a visit from the chief and the, and the chief was uh, visiting uh, all the stations. And the chief told him, he goes, you know, next time I'm going to visit, I'm going to let you know so you can send an email out to everybody and make sure they're in Class B uniforms because I don't want to visit the firefighters <laughs> if they're not in their, you know, yeah. Class B with the badges and, and all that stuff. And and this battalion chief said, um, you want everyone to be comfortable with you, right? Yes. Well, then why do they have to dress up when you're at the station? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense that it's this formal event when the when the chief comes in. So I, I don't believe that it should be a formal event. I mean, it should no. be you're dropping in, 
for a purpose. Say I've got something to drop off, but it's not like an inspection where I'm no, trying you know, to you know look at everyone's uniform. You know how you know how that that'll never happen is when your boss shows up and they're dressed in brush pants and a t-shirt mm-hmm. that yeah. says Phoenix Fire Department or whatever your fire department is on right. the back. And so they're dressed just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, <clears throat> the pushback we got were from other chiefs, staff chiefs that always wore their cl- clown costume. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, I don't like that you get to wear that. And I said, well, yeah, <clears throat> I actually have a job in operations. I don't know what to tell you, pal. You know, there <laughs> is some culture. Like when I was in Houston, I would, for about three and a half years, I lived there without my wife. She lived here taking care of the grand and I was there. So I had a lot of time to visit fire station. I'd go in the <laughs> evening, i go on the weekends. It kept me out of trouble. So, And so I would just show up at a fire station and the Houston firefighters, I'd just park in the back and start walking in somebody. And then you'd hear, Chief's here, Chief's here on the intercom, mm-hmm. however they say that. And they would all get up and they would line up like in formation in mm-hmm. front of what their oh, apparatus. Salute and they'd have and a I flag. Told them, I and told them, I, I said, hey, guys, you don't got to do that. I said, I just came by to say hi, and, you know, you shake their hand, felt like you're running for office. But they were all so respectful. They, I couldn't get them to stop doing it. I said, please, don't do that. No, we're not going to stop doing that. That's the way they are in Texas. They're kind of respectful like that. But it's like, please don't do that. So I kept visiting stations. They kept doing it. I never got them to change that part of it. And, you know, I quit going. Uh, no, yes. uh, uh, this painful. Power. Well, I, I if we would get over that piece of it. Then we go upstairs and we sit at the table and have a conversation or, or walk <laughs> around the apparatus, have a good conversation. But the front end of it was so, you know, that tradition was there for them. Now, they didn't dress any different. I wouldn't expect that. But I just kept telling them, please don't do that. Now, Chief, you don't understand. Uh, I was lactose and I'm lactose intolerant. And they were sometimes I'd go around lunchtime, not because I wanted to eat with them, but um, but they would try to feed me. And I said, no, I'm lactose intolerant. They'd say, well, let me make you a special plate. Uh, No, that ain't. (laughs) No, 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 no. no. You should share that with people like that. I I would walk in a fire station and start giving my medical history to people. Well, I just told told them I can't eat. and you know, I'm not hungry. Thank you. Yeah, but no, I told them. They're like, well, let me make it. And they're like, no, I don't. I know firefighters too well. I don't want a special. But they were always incredibly nice. Well, if you show up, if you're the boss and you show up and you've got to, okay, I've got to find something wrong to prove I'm the boss. Oh, that's ridiculous. We were... We were coming back from a call, <clears throat> it, it, a car accident or some damn thing, and somebody left a piece of equipment at the scene. It, and it was, a, it was a Glendale fire truck. And we thought, okay, we'll just take that. You know, they took the patient to the hospital. Right. We'll just take it back to the station. It's on our way. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know. It was 45 minutes later, we go to this fire station. They're back in quarters. And it had been raining. That's what caused this whole thing. Well, they got this yellow truck, and it's brown now because it's been driving on code three calls in the rain all day. So we come in and it, it's, hey, we're here. Here's your stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so we're leaving. And uh, what the engineer says to the captain, he says, Chiefs are different in Phoenix than they are in Glendale. It was, what are you talking about? He says, well, we left the thing and you picked it up and dropped it off to us. He says, our chief just left 10 minutes ago. He says, you know what he said? I said, no, why? He says, he told us he'd never seen a truck so dirty in his life. <laughs> well, I thought, it, it, it's raining outside. Wait, he wants you to walk. You should have told it, gave him a bucket and told him to help yourself, pal. Yeah. yeah. The, when you're done, there's a ladder. Another mile down the road, you can go wash it, idiot. I mean, Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, um, so, you went, so you went from meetings to, like, really have a purpose and show up and don't be a dick. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm here. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess oh. you can identify a dirty truck from a fire truck. Is that a dirty yeah. word? Don't listen to that anymore. Worshers. Mm-hmm. Worshers. I can't say it. Well, uh, beep. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, right. uh, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, you lines know, of communication, Vance. Lines yeah. of communication. And I think you you got to keep them open, but, but don't overdo it. Also, on these, you're talking about, there's a couple of apps that you can use now. One's called the Slack Channel or Slack Channel. Another one is called um, Campfire. So that there's there's entire chiefs command staffs. They they communicate on Campfire, and 
Oh. Then, like, you or can have could, different channels on them. They could them, just so. text each other, too. Well, that's the, all, all the thing really is, is. is it, if, if it's like a logistics issue, then you go to logistics channel. Gotcha. If it's an operations mm-hmm. issue, you go to operations. If oh, it's wow. admin, you go. So, so you're not inundating people with messages they don't care about. But if it's a logistics thing, okay, I'm going to go to the yeah. logistics thing mm-hmm. and, and get my question answered or whatever. So The key is just don't send out garbage to people. Don't, and, 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 and expect don't, them to yeah. read it. Don't overdo it. And and, yeah. and make it meaningful, mm-hmm. and then be transparent. Don't don't hide anything from folks. Well, and you can have periodic meetings where you meet. I mean, that was kind of the nice thing about using committees to manage the fire department is it was a standing schedule of meetings you yeah. would have, and you think, okay, and those worked really well. Where I have to go process some operational issues that we're going to do now, whether it's the the ladder fleet is aged and it's not working the way it needs to, so we're going to need to change the way we do ladders at the scene. That yeah. that kind of stuff so and and it was a it was a good format to do that because everybody could comment and have a voice in it and you could somehow incorporate all that into a tangible plan moving forward and and then and then those committees saw oh we did this and that this is was the effect of this is it actually had a good thing whereas because it's always going to be 50 50 this is stupid waste of time or we have to get together to fix whatever this is so those are the two. And it's never in the middle. It's always one or the other, in my experience. And I know you don't want this podcast to last forever. But the other thing that I've noticed. Gary Fleischer does. Yes, yeah. he does. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, do. The other thing I notice in organizations is the, the labor groups are really good about getting information out. They got stewards. They visit the fire stations. They listen. Maybe it's because of their content's different. But they, it seems out like labor groups outperform us all the time in communications. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what they're, use, they're a political them. committee. They're designed to do that, but to, to, can, to yeah. influence people's minds and hearts. But you can use them a little bit, too, to if you get a message. You know, if it's something that kind of matches with what you're doing operationally or resource-wise. And there was a time in an organization where I went out with the labor president. It's like, hey, let's go out together. Let's send the stewards out with the battalion chiefs. you got to have great relationships when you do that. But they're really, really good. Hey, man, there's sometimes where, like, the fire chief and union president would be doing whatever together, their message, and you think we are so screwed. <laughs> they're together. Where there's, yeah, they're there's on the no, same page. There is no shade to hide in on this one. Yeah. <laughs> Mom and dad's in the same camp. Yeah, exactly. On the we ain't ca- having two Christmases this year. <laughs> yeah, they're, on, they're sitting on the couch together. Don't walk by. Yeah, no, we're, yeah they figured. They found out. <laughs> All right, gents. Okay. Uh, Good times. Acts are the best. Thanks for being here on B-Shifter. Uh, we'll Woo-hoo! catch you next time. Yes, indeed.